Number two, Adele Komarovsky. In May 1973, Adele Komarovsky was 26 years old and she was finishing her master's thesis at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Komarovsky was well liked at the university and she had an active social life. She spoke five languages and people thought that she looked like Ava Gardner, the movie star. Komarovsky got a lot of attention from men and even though she was engaged, she didn't exactly ignore the attention. She was set to fly out to Germany to be with her fiancé when she finished the semester and they were to be wed shortly afterwards. On the night of May 15, 1973, Komarovsky was working in an office on campus. Around 11.15 p.m. she left the office and walked a short distance to the all-female dormitory where she was staying. When she reached the courtyard of the dorm, she was grabbed by someone. A woman in the dorm who was up studying heard her scream, No, no, please let me go. Oh, please don't hurt me. She then saw Komarovsky being dragged into the ravine behind the dorm. She called campus security who descended upon the ravine within minutes. Unfortunately, they were too late and they found Komarovsky dead in the ravine. The police were called and 40 officers along with several dogs and 20 volunteers searched the ravine and found no trace of the killer. The medical examiner confirmed what was obvious from looking at her body. Komarovsky had been strangled. A piece of rope had been expertly tied around her neck, leading down her back and wrapped around her wrist, binding her hands behind her. It looked like the killer pulled on the rope to drag her out to the ravine. The police knew that the killer brought the rope with him, and since it was so expertly tied, they think that the killer came to the campus with the intention of attacking someone. What they aren't sure about is if she was specifically targeted, or just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. There are three theories about who killed Komorowski. The first theory is that she was killed by an unknown multiple murderer who was lurking in Hamilton. Four months after Komorowski was killed, another young woman in Hamilton was murdered. On the night of September 28, 1978, 20-year-old Gail Ryan was out at a bar that was popular with university students. She was last seen leaving the bar with an unidentified man. Her dead body was found the next day in her apartment. Her sweater was pulled over her head, but otherwise she was nude. She had been hit in the head with a pop bottle and stabbed multiple times. In 1997, a detective with the Hamilton Police Department, Steve Harb, said that the cases could be connected. He said that they were killed four months apart, the motives seemed to be similar, and the victim profiles were also very similar. He thought that the killer was comfortable among students, and he didn't look out place with them or on campus. Like Komorowski's murder, no one has ever been arrested for the murder of Gail Ryan. The second theory is that Komorowski was murdered by a serial killer named Robert Garrow. Garrow was born in March 1936 in Danamora, New York. His father was a violent alcoholic and his mother was a callous and cruel woman. Since his early teens, Garrow showed signs of violent tendencies and he engaged in disturbing sexual behavior with farm animals. At the age of 21, he was charged with sexually assaulting a college student. When the police went to arrest him, he ran and he fired several shots at the police. Luckily, he didn't kill anyone and he was taken into custody. He was convicted and sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison. He ended up serving seven years. In the five years after he was released, he committed at least four more sexual assaults. He tied up and assaulted two young college students, and he also assaulted two young girls. Instead of showing up for his court date for assaulting the two young girls, Garrow fled the area. On July 29, 1973, Garrow was driving his orange Volkswagen hatchback in the Adirondack Mountains near Wells, New York. 
The Anadirondacks is a massive mountain range that is about the same size as the state of Vermont. As he drove, he spotted a campsite near the highway. He approached the campsite with his rifle, his knife, and some rope. In the two tents, he found three young men and a young woman. At gunpoint, he led the four campers deeper into the woods and then made them tie each other to some trees. Three of the hostages cooperated and did anything that Garrow told them to do. 18-year-old Phil Dumbluski didn't want to cooperate and he was mouthy with Garrow. Garrow was still able to get one of his friends to tie him up. After everyone was tied up, Garrow started slashing Dumbluski's chest with his knife and then he finally plunged his knife into his chest, killing him. While Dumbluski was being killed, two of his friends managed to free themselves and they ran for help. The police raced to the woods and found Dumbluski dead, but the fourth friend was luckily still alive. The police searched the forest, but Garrow had escaped. As the manhunt spanned from hours to days, more police were called in. Garrow had been driving around the back roads of the Anadirondacks, trying to avoid the police. His car was finally spotted by the police two days after the murder. A high-speed chase ensued, and Garrow crashed his car. He then ran through the woods, and the police eventually lost him. After he abandoned his car, the police searched it and traced it back to Garrow, and wanted posters were handed out. He was finally spotted again by the police 11 days later. He tried to run away, and he was shot several times. Besides the murder of Dombluski, Garrow was the prime suspect in three other murders that happened weeks before he went on the run. On July 11, 1973, 16-year-old Alicia Houck from Syracuse went missing while walking home from school. Garrow lived in Syracuse at the time of her disappearance, and he was seen near her school on the same day that she went missing. Then, just nine days later, the body of 22-year-old Daniel Porter was found at his campsite near Weaverton, New York. Porter had been tied to a tree and stabbed to death. His girlfriend, 20-year-old Susan Petz, was still missing. Garrow's parents lived just a few miles away from where the couple was camping. Garrow's two defense lawyers, Frank Armini and Francis Belgi, convinced him to be honest about all of his crimes because it might be better for him in the long run. So Garrow confessed to the four murders. He said that he stabbed Alicia after sexually assaulting her and then he dumped her body in a cemetery. He kidnapped Pets from the campsite and sexually assaulted her for three days. He killed her when she tried to escape and he threw her body down a mine shaft. After the confession, his lawyers found themselves in a moral dilemma. Garrow had client attorney privilege, but the lawyers knew the location of two missing women and their families were obviously looking for them. Also, if they didn't go to the police with the information, were they helping Garrow cover up his crimes? At first, the lawyers weren't even sure if Garrow was telling the truth. So they went to the locations where he said he dumped the bodies. They found the bodies where Garrow said they'd be. One of the lawyers, Francis Belgi, ended up moving the remains of Alicia to take a photograph. Yet, they still didn't report the locations of the bodies to the police. Garrow's trial began in June 1974. Garrow appeared in court in a wheelchair, claiming it was needed after he was shot by the police. Garrow testified and he admitted to the four murders along with seven rapes in shocking detail. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to 25 years to life. It was later revealed that Garrow's lawyers knew the whereabouts of the two bodies and said nothing. This revelation made national headlines. It raised the moral question about how far a defense lawyer should go when trying to protect attorney-client privilege. Their cases were presented to the grand jury, who decided only to indict Belgi for health violations for touching Alicia's body. Neither lawyer lost their license. On September 8, 1978, Garrow walked away from the medium security prison where he was doing a sentence in Fishkill, New York. 
Garrow, who had still been using the wheelchair, was being held in a ward for the elderly and disabled. When he escaped, he was armed with a handgun that was smuggled into the prison in the bottom of a bucket of fried chicken. Three days later, Garrow still hadn't been captured. The police thought that Garrow had escaped to Syracuse or the Androndacks. It turned out he was a few hundred feet from the prison. After climbing the prison's fence and walking into the woods, he found a hole and hid there for three days. On the third day of his escape, a search team was doing another sweep of the woods. Catching them by surprise, Garrow walked towards them, firing his gun. They returned fire and Garrow was killed. Luckily, no one else was killed in the shooting. Garrow only confessed to four murders, but the police think that he may have committed more. Jim Tracy, a former newspaper reporter, wrote a book about Garrow, and he suggested that Garrow was the killer of Adele Komorowski. Komorowski was killed two months before Garrow's first confirmed murder. Hamilton is just over 200 miles away from Syracuse, where Garrow was living at the time. Garrow carried rope with him, and many of his victims were tied up. Also, at the time of the murder, a Volkswagen was seen near a trail that led through the ravine to the university. Garrow drove a Volkswagen at the time. After Garrow crashed his car, the police searched it and they found a map with 27 red dots on it. One of those red dots were in Hamilton. Apparently that map and what the red dots might represent haunted the detective who found it all the way up until the day he died. Garrow may have been responsible for the murder of Komorowski, but he couldn't have been the person who killed Gail Ryan. Ryan was murdered while Garrow was in custody. The police in Hamilton think it's possible that Garrow killed Komorowski, but they don't think that's what happened. Instead, the Hamilton police have a third theory about what happened to Komorowski. Komorowski was going to get married shortly before she was killed. They think that a rejected lover or admirer killed her. Unfortunately, these are just theories, and the murder of Adele Komorowski is considered cold. Number 1. The Mad City Murders In the fall of 1967, 18-year-old Christine Rothschild of Chicago, Illinois, moved into her dorm at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, also known by its acronym, UW. One reason that her parents chose to send her to UW was because they thought that Madison was a safe place to live. In the spring of 1968, Rothschild, who had worked as a part-time model in Chicago, was being stalked at school. She received several mysterious phone calls and she saw someone looking through the window of her dorm room, which was on the first floor. She told the campus police about the stalking and they told her to buy a whistle. After attending church on the morning of May 25, 1968, Rothschild was walking through the campus back to her dorm room. Later that evening, her body was found in some bushes behind a lecture hall. Her death had been brutal. She had been stabbed 14 times in the chest with a medical scalpel. One of these stab wounds punctured her heart, which was the death blow. Her killer stabbed her so hard that he broke a few of her ribs. Her upper and lower jaw had been broken with a blunt object. After she was dead, a strip of cloth from the lining of her jacket was wrapped around her neck and tied around her throat like a garrote. After removing the strip of cloth, the medical examiner made a surprise discovery. Her sheepskin gloves had been shoved down her throat. She was fully clothed and her boots were on her feet. She had not been sexually assaulted. Missing from the crime scene was the ribbon that she wore in her hair, her lighter, and her pantyhose. That means the killer removed the boots to get the pantyhose and then he put the boots back on. A man's handkerchief was found under her head and her broken umbrella was found stabbed into the ground a short distance away. Eight years would go by and no one was arrested for the murder of Christine Rothschild. Then on July 21st, 1976, 
the police were called to a field a few miles away from Cross Plains, Wisconsin. Some burned human remains were found by two surveyors. The remains had to be identified using dental records. Her name was Deborah Bennett, and she was just a few days shy of her 21st birthday. Her father, who was terminally ill, died shortly after hearing the news, and the family held a joint funeral. On the last day that Deborah was seen, she had been evicted from her apartment in Madison. She had rented a cheap hotel room, but she never moved into it. She was last seen walking down the road barefoot near her apartment, about 20 miles away from where her body was found. The cause of death couldn't be determined because of the state of the body. Three weeks after her body was found, her hotel key was mailed to the hotel. The police have no idea who mailed it. Two years later, in May 1978, Julianne Hall of Fennimore, Wisconsin, moved to Madison. She accepted a job as a library assistant at the University of Madison, Wisconsin Historical Society, which was on the main campus. Two months later, on the night of June 16th, she went out to a local pub and she was seen drinking with an unknown man. Her body was found four days later, about 14 miles away from where she was last seen. Her body was badly decomposed. At first, the medical examiner thought that she had been struck in the head several times with a blunt object. After further examination, it is now believed that she was struck once with a blunt object and she died from exposure. Nearly a year later, on March 27, 1979, another Julie living in Madison went missing. This time it was 20-year-old Julie Spearsnyder, who was out at a bar on University Avenue in Madison. She was last seen hitchhiking near the bar. A hiker found her body two years later, around 12 miles away from where she was last seen near the town of Dunn. On December 15, 1979, 24-year-old Susan LeMatthew was reported missing. LeMatthew had both physical and developmental disabilities. She lived in a group home that was a former dormitory for the university. Her remains were found four months later, 150 feet from the parking lot of the university's arboretum. The cause of death couldn't be determined because of the state of the body. On January 2, 1980, 17-year-old Shirley Stewart went missing after a shift at work. She worked as a maid at a medical center that was about a mile from the university campus. Her body was found about 11 miles north of where she was last seen, about a year and a half after she went missing. Her skeletal remains didn't show any signs of trauma. The medical examiners said that it was possible that she was stabbed or strangled to death but couldn't say with certainty. Two years later, just after midnight on July 2nd, 1982, Donna Mraz, a 23-year-old UW student, was walking home from work. Just outside one of the entrances to the university stadium, Mraz was stabbed several times. She died hours later in the hospital. Over the years, the police, the press, and the people of Madison have speculated if one killer was responsible for most, if not all, the murders. The seven victims shared a few similarities. They were all in their late teens or early twenties. Most of them had long dark hair that was parted in the middle. Finally, many of them had connections to UW. The killer is called the Mad City Killer or the Capital City Killer. At least four serial killers have concerned suspects in some of the murders. The first is a set of serial killers, Otis Toole and Henry Lee Lucas. Detectives from Madison interviewed Lucas in 1984, and he said that he and Toole visited Madison and killed a few of the women. However, Lucas was notorious for confessing to hundreds of murders that he didn't commit. There is also no evidence linking him to any of the murders. Another person of interest is a serial killer named William Floyd Zamito, who was born in Madison. In August 1978, Zamito kidnapped 23-year-old Mary Johnson from a parking lot in Madison. 
He drove her to a park where he sexually assaulted her and then shot her in the head. The police were able to link Zemedal to the murder because he dropped his wallet at the crime scene. He confessed to the murder and he was sentenced to life plus 20 years in prison. In prison, he bragged about three more murders. He killed the 22-year-old daughter of an FBI agent in Tucson, Arizona in May 1973, and he beat to death a brother and a sister who were hitchhiking after their car broke down near Barstow, California in February 1978. Zamato was living in Madison in 1968 when Christine Rothschild was killed, and he would have been 16 at the time of the murder. When Deborah Bennett was killed eight years later, Zemedo was living in the Southwest and he moved back to Wisconsin a month after Julianne Hall went missing. Then he was arrested just months later for the murder of Mary Johnson, meaning he couldn't have been responsible for any of the other murders. Linda Tomaszewski, a friend of Christine Rothschild, says that she knows who killed her. Tomaszewski also attended UW and that is where she befriended Rothschild. She said it's a serial killer who is responsible for a whole other set of murders outside of Madison. On the day before she died, Rothschild told people who her stalker was, Niels Born Jorgensen, a medical researcher at the university who was in his 40s at the time. Tomaszewski went to the police with the information, but they didn't pay much attention to her. So she started to investigate Niels herself. She interviewed people at the university hospital where he was a medical researcher, and she also interviewed his roommate. Tomaszewski learned that before Niels came to Madison, he was in South Africa. While living there, he apparently butchered an entire family and took photographs of their dead bodies. Niels supposedly showed the photographs to a janitor at the hospital and bragged about killing the family. In two separate incidences, Niels pulled a gun on his roommate and superior at the hospital. Both times he put the gun away and walked out of the room. Shortly after pulling the gun on his superior, Niels hastily packed up what he could and he left town. This was two days after Rothschild was killed. The police from Madison did eventually decide to interview him. They located him in New York City. Two detectives traveled there to interview him and give him a polygraph test. When the detectives were about to escort him to the local police station, he made up an excuse not to do the polygraph test and then he fled town again. This time the police didn't track him down. After Niels left Madison, his former roommate found a weird manuscript hidden in his room and he gave it to Tomaszewski. The manuscript was called The Love Pirate and it was written by Neil's mother, Heidi. Years later, when his mother was dying, Niels got the manuscript published. The story is about a doctor named Francis Corcoran who wears a doctor's jacket when he goes hunting. He falls in love with a young woman named Annabelle who lives in San Francisco, but she doesn't love him back. So he kidnaps her and takes her away to a place called Paradise Valley in the Pacific Northwest so that he can make her fall in love with him. Tomaszewski thinks that the manuscript is a written confession penned by Neil's mother. Neil's mother knew some of the crimes that he committed and the story was an allegory about those crimes. The protagonist of the story, Dr. Francis Cochran, is based on her son, Dr. Niels Born Jorgensen. Some of the names and the themes in the story seem to be symbolic. For example, Cochran is a maximum security prison in California, not far from where Niels grew up. The love interest in the manuscript is named Annabelle, and is spelt the same way as the titular character of Edgar Allan Poe's last completed poem. In the poem, the speaker is in love with a woman who has died, named Annabelle. Since she died, he loves her even more. In The Love Pirate, Francis Cochran is a strong swimmer. In real life, Neil's younger brother, Soren, died in a mysterious diving accident in the autumn of 1949 
when he was 20 years old. Soren was an experienced diver and he had a spotter, but his belt malfunctioned and he drowned. Soren was considered the golden child of the family and Niels was more of the black sheep. Tomaszewski thought that this may be hints that Niels' mother knew that he killed his brother. Tomaszewski also started to wonder if Annabelle was a stand-in for a real woman or real women. For decades, Tomaszewski scoured records and news stories looking for other possible victims. In the 2017 book, Mad City, author and criminology professor Mike Arnfield explores several of these possible victims. The case with the most striking similarities to the murder of Rothschild is the murder of 19-year-old Judith Williamson. Early on the morning of October 29, 1963, four years before Rothschild was killed, Williamson left her family home in Albany, California to take the bus to the University of California, Berkeley. When she didn't return home, her parents notified the police. The campus was searched and a large puddle of blood was found in a parking garage that Williamson was known to walk through. The police think that she was attacked there and put into the trunk of a car. This suggests that the killer knew Williamson's habits because he knew she'd be in the parking garage. The killer may have also known where Williamson lived. The umbrella that she was carrying with her on the day that she went missing was found in a garbage can in a plaza about a mile from her home two days after she went missing. The person who found it didn't realize it belonged to the missing young woman until 10 days later and then they contacted the police. The day after that, two blood smeared textbooks and a mechanical pencil with Williamson's name was found in a garbage can on the campus. Witnesses who were near the parking garage on the morning that Williamson disappeared were interviewed. Two people said that they saw a convertible driving slowly through the parking garage around the time it's believed that Williamson was attacked. 29 months would go by before Williamson's body was found. Her body had been dumped down a highway embankment in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Only the top portion of her body was found. She had been stabbed 15 times in the chest with an instrument that had a narrow blade. It appeared that all of her clothes were still on, but during an examination of the torso, it was revealed that her bra was missing. That means the killer most likely undressed her, took her bra, and then redressed her. The lower half of her body has never been found. It's believed that animals took it away. There are several clear similarities between the murders of Williamson and Rothschild. They were both freshmen that were quite possibly stalked and attacked on a university campus. They were both stabbed over a dozen times with a narrow blade. In both cases, the killer undressed the victim to take souvenirs and then redressed them. Niels can also be connected to Williamson's murder. He lived in California at the time of her murder, and he was at the University of California, Berkeley, a month before she was killed. He was there for a reunion because the University of California, Berkeley, was his alma mater. Finally, at the time, Niels drove a convertible. The problem with the theory about Niels being Williamson's killer is that someone already confessed was convicted and served time for her murder. Joseph Otto Engberger, who was the son of the former mayor of Albany, confessed in 1977, 14 years after the murder. He said that he had recovered memories about killing her. He attended school with Williamson, and he said that he snapped after she rejected his advances. He ended up being sentenced to five years in prison. Engberger later recanted, and there was no physical evidence tying him to the crime. He also didn't know anything about the murder that didn't appear in the newspapers. Tomaszewski thinks that this was a false confession, and Niels is the more likely suspect. Besides exploring Niels' past for possible victims, Tomaszewski also kept track of him for 40 years. 
This included sending him a Valentine's Day card every year for 26 years straight. In spring 2011, a student of Arnfield's called Niels and interviewed him about Rothschild's murder. She asked him, hypothetically, why would the killer have stabbed her 14 times? He said that it seemed like it was a lot of rage. She asked him what it meant that Rothschild's gloves were shoved down her throat. He gave several possible explanations, and one of those explanations was that Rothschild said something that she shouldn't have. On the day before she was killed, Rothschild named Niels as her stalker. Finally, the student flat out asked Niels if he killed Christine Rothschild. He said, I never even knew her. I had no reason to kill her or any other teenager. I had no interest. One good thrust would do the job, if you had the knowledge of anatomy to do it anyways, you know? He said that Rothschild may have crossed someone in the wrong way, and these things happen. He then laughed. What is noticeable about his answer is that he didn't say no. He just said he would have no reason to do it. Niels Born Jorgensen was never charged with Rothschild's murder or any other murder. He died on February 16, 2013, and he was cremated. If Tomaszewski's theory is correct, and Niels killed Rothschild and left town two days later, then who killed the other six women? Unfortunately, that is still a mystery. It's not even clear if one person, several people, or even six different people are responsible for each murder. After all, there are some fairly significant differences between many of the victims and how they were killed. Proponents of the theory that a serial killer is at least responsible for a few of the murders ask what are the odds that six young women all around the same age who shared similar physical features and lived and worked in the same geographical area all met on timely ends. Unless someone comes forward with information, this question may never be answered. The murders of the six women are currently considered cold. Thanks a lot for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. We post a new video every Thursday and Sunday. If you already do subscribe, thank you so much for doing so. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. We may even follow you back. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.